Yep. Right. Um, well, um, I think I've met most of you, but if I haven't, my name is Sumeya Said. Um, I am joined by Dr. Destash today, and we are going to review the new updates in the vancomycin therapeutic monitoring guidelines. Um, we have several objectives to get through, but we'll start by uh, reviewing the changes to the new 2020 vancomycin monitoring guidelines. Um, and we are going to focus on the adult patient since that's what we see in our practice. Um, we'll also discuss different ways of therapeutic drug monitoring using the AUC calculation values. And then finally, we'll end by demonstrating some sample of vanco dosing calculations. So this new update, the 2020 guideline, is basically a consensus revision to the 2009 guidelines for serious MRSA infections. Um, this was done by all the major um, groups, so um, ASHP, SIDP, the PEDS ID, um, and then um, IDSA. So the older recommendations did not address all the aspects of vanco dosing, like PEDS dosing or dosing in obesity or like kidney failure or dialysis. So um, this review was supposed to include more of those things. Um, it, it, while we discuss this um, new guideline, um, keep in mind that the recommendation is only for MRSA um, serious infections. So um, it include, uh, excludes, sorry, um, non-bacteremic skin and skin structure infections, UTI, um, and then also excludes other gram-positive pathogens like MSSA um, or coag negative staph. So the focus is just on MRSA. And the major limitation with this review is that there's really limited randomized clinical trials for vanco dosing and monitoring. So a lot of these are based on like smaller trials um, done. All right, some review on the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of vancomycin. Um, it does exhibit the AUC to MIC um, kill. So uh, just a reminder, the AUC is the area under the curve and the MIC is the minimum inhibitory concentration. So the goal AUC to MIC ratio is over 400 um, to show the bacterial cytal activity. The studies have shown that when it's less than 400, that's when we end up with resistance. Um, and here, uh, the MIC is determined by the broth microdilution. So you'll see the VMD on the slides. Um, this target, um, the AUC target, the AUC to MIC ratio target, um, this was really determined by retrospective single center observational studies um, of MRSA bacteremia. A lot of these studies focused on vancomycin clearance, um, and that's how they end up, ended up with the calculations for these values. So um, I have it here underlined again, the goal AUC to MIC uh, BMD is 400 to 600 for serious MRSA infections. Um, a lot of the dosing um, for most people uh, would be appropriate to have 15 to 20 milligrams per kilo using actual body weight. So this is nothing new and most patients will end up with Q8 to Q12 intervals. Um, this is again adult uh, non-obese patients. So no real change there. Vancomycin-related toxicity is obviously something we always worry about, um, an AKI most commonly. There's been changes um, and a lot of revisions on what we define um, as a change in creatinine or an AKI. Um, it used to be a change of 0.5 um, or 50% change. Um, but most recently, the definition that's been adopted is that a change of zero, greater than or equal to 0.3 milligrams per deciliter in the serum creatinine um, over 48 hours, so two consecutive days. Um, and this is the definition um, that came from the Kidney Injury Network and then the Kidney Disease, um, the KDGO uh, guideline. Um, in these studies that were reviewed for this guideline, uh, the prevalence of AKI varied really from 5 to 43%, um, and it happened mostly between days 4 and 17 of therapy. Um, what's really important about this is that an 
it's an acute kidney injury and you know we can't think oh you know they'll recover because a lot of the times if they're critically ill or if they have some underlying conditions um, they might never go back to a normal uh, kidney function or a serum creatinine so it is important to try to avoid that um, but uh, maintaining an AUC value between 400 to 600 um, should really reduce that risk of nephrotoxicity. So let's just compare AUC to trough monitoring. Um, we just said that the uh, data about nephrotoxicity, so the risk of AKI really increases as the trough increases. So for maintaining a trough over 15 to 20, which we have to do a lot of the time for our serious infections. Um, but when it comes to AUC, the risk is really when the AUC is above 650. So we shouldn't really be getting to that AUC in clinical practice. Um, this study um, was included in the guidelines, but I wanted to share because it compared the two. Um, so it was over a thousand hospitalized patients to compare the risk of nephrotoxicity in AUC monitoring um, versus trough concentration monitoring. And what they found was that when they monitored the AUC, they had a significant decrease in AKI. Uh, with a statistically significant p-value. Um, so previously, we always said our goal trough was 15 to 20 for MRSA infections, um, but all of these studies recently are showing that this might not be a good indicator therapeutically of our AUC value. So that's why the trough monitoring is no longer recommended for serious MRSA infections. Um, but right now, there's not enough data to really have this recommendation for non-invasive infections or non-MRSA uh, infections. Um, and what AUC measures is the amount of cumulative drug exposure, so the serum drug concentration to time curve over a specific set interval. But a trough is really just a simple point at the end of that dosing interval, so it doesn't provide us was with as much information. And again, just the trough level is just gonna show us a single minimum AUC value, but a 24 hour AUC will show us an average over that period. So to get an, a 24 hour AUC, it's just multiplying that value over 24 hours. Um, and if our trough is between 15 to 20, um, the assumption is that the AUC is going to be over 400, which is the therapeutic level we want. Um, and then when we do maintain the AUC between four and 600, um, we have that therapeutic level, but we also should have a reduced um, risk of AKI. Um, all of this is um, possible if we assume the MIC um, is one. We'll talk about more um, what it means if the MIC is over one. Um, and then, okay. okay, yeah. So, um, so now I'm going to talk about some of the different factors that can affect dosing in patients. So, obesity um, usually is defined as a BMI greater than or equal to 30 kilograms per meter squared, um, and most patients. Um, because you have to give them a higher dose, we usually dose based on actual body weight. There's an increased risk of nephrotoxicity because we're just using higher doses. There's some data to show that vancomycin, just because of its large molecular weight, uh, may not um, permeate into adipose tissue um, very well. And so that can actually lead to um, higher concentrations um, and then a higher risk of um, nephrotoxicity. So when we're considering a loading dose for patients that are obese, usually we recommend 20 to 25 milligrams per kilogram using the actual body weight, um, the actual weight um, of the patient. And we've had lots of patients or some patients 
that are um, quite obese in the range of 40 to 60 BMI. And so we cap the dose. Um, we have a maximum dose that we would infuse um, and we don't go higher than that until we get a um, plasma concentration um, so that we can make sure that we're not causing any um, nephrotoxicity or, or try to reduce the risk of nephrotoxicity um, in these um, morbidly obese patients. So, and then empiric maintenance doses, just for guidelines for obese patients, shouldn't exceed 4,500 milligrams per day. And so some of these people are um, quite young and some of them are quite a bit older. And so you might be able to give um, a vancomycin dose every 12 hours or you might have to give it every uh, 24 hours once a day. And so that's going to be dependent on their um, AUC to MIC ratio. Okay, so next slide then. So additionally, the volume of distribution in obesity does not increase with actual body weight in a proportional manner. It's actually lower for obese patients. Um, you usually use a lower empiric volume of distribution estimate, and that's 0.5 liters per kilo if you assume a one compartment model. Most volume of distribution, most empiric um, vancomycin volume of distribution for non-obese patients is 0.7 to 0.8 milligram or liters per kilo. So the empiric maintenance dose is always based on your um, estimated um, clearance of vancomycin. And vancomycin clearance is primarily predicted by kidney function. And so um, Ryan Crass um, at the University of Pittsburgh um, looked at um, vancomycin clearance and came up with this um, regression equation uh, looking at age, the serum creatinine, um, the sex of the individual where you put in one for males or zero for females, um, and then their total body weight uh, multiplied to the 0.75 power. And this will actually um, predict what their vancomycin clearance should be um, based on their um, body size. And so this might be a good um, equation for you to try in some of your obese patients um, looking at some of the different factors that, that we can um, assess um, individually. Next slide. So the AUC calculations um, are either based on software, there's um, Bayesian software that's been reported to be more accurate than the um, one compartment model equations or just an Excel spreadsheet that's for Um, and so if you were to use uh, Bayesian software, um, it's more accurate with a piece of saw than it is with just a saw concentration. Um, and the good thing about the software is you don't have to wait until a patient gets to steady state. You can predict what their steady state concentrations are going to be and so a lot of people who have adopted um, AUC dosing um, actually um, get a peak in a trough uh, within the first 48 hours worth of therapy um, and then individualize the, the dosing based on those levels. The AUC calculations, um, basically you want a peak concentration 
um, one to two hours after the dose is infused. So um, I know a lot of places have different policies depending on how big of the dose that you give, you might infuse that over an hour or up to two hours. And then a trough concentration during that same dosing interval um, is something that would be appropriate to get. And then you can uh, manipulate those concentrations um, to estimate your AUC. Um, and so um, the trough concentration may not reflect an accurate AUC. Um, and so um, for serious MRSA uh, infections, um, it's more accurate to get an actual AUC um, measurement or calculation than it is to base things on trough concentrations. Um, next slide then. Okay, so um, there's certainly several different programs that are out there for um, software. Um, there is one, um, Dose Me RX, um, which is um, something that can integrate into your Epic software if you have Epic. Um, and um, you can contact Jackie um, at MD Stewardship um, if you have questions or if you're interested in hearing more about the Bayesian software. Um, and so that's something that um, hopefully will be available um, in the near future. And um, we hope to be able to offer that potentially um, to those hospitals that are interested. Um, next slide then. Okay, so vancomycin dosing in renal failure is something that um, causes a lot of questions and a lot of difficulties um, because um, vancomycin is primarily eliminated through the kidney. Um, so um, the hemodialysis membranes have improved over time and the dia dialyzers have become um, significantly more permeable to high molecular weight drugs. Um, and so it's important to look at a weight-based dosing based on actual body weight in those patients that are um, having um, renal failure and dialysis. Um, the recommendations that are in the guidelines for vancomycin is to maintain a pre-dialysis serum concentration between 15 to 20, and that will likely achieve an AUC between 400 and 600 in the previous um, 24 hours. So in patients that are on hemodialysis, then if you can get a uh, random concentration before they get placed on the dialyzer, um, that actually is probably useful. Um, and then what you have to do is talk with your dialysis nurse and find out if they're using a high permeability dialyzer or a low permeability dialyzer. And the guidelines actually dictate what um, dose you would wanna give um, at the end of dialysis um, based on that particular type of dialyzer that, um, that they're currently using. So the loading dose um, doesn't change because all you're trying to do with the loading dose is fill up the volume of distribution. And so the um, dialyzer will affect your vancomycin clearance which is um, based on, uh, which is what your maintenance dose should be based on. So if you have a high permeability um, dialyzer, um, then you can give um, 10 milligrams per kilogram um, based on actual body weight at the end of the dialysis session. Um, if it's a low permeability dialyzer, 
um, then you can uh, recommend 7.5 because there will be more drug in the plasma after a low dialysis, a low permeability dialysis session um, compared to a high permeability dialysis session. Uh, okay, next slide then. Okay, some people actually get um, continuous renal replacement therapy where you basically use your cardiac output as your pump for your dialyzer. Um, and so this would be considered somewhat of a hybrid dialysis session because you're continuously on hemodialysis or on, on this type of dialysis. Um, and so um, vancomycin is removed by CRRT um, and the clearance is related closely to the rate of your ultra, ultra filtrate or your dialysate flow. So um, if you have a patient that's on CRRT, you can ask the dialysis nurse, what's your dialysate flow or your ultra filtrate flow in your patient? Um, and then you can base that your, how much is being removed in 24 hours based on that um, dialysis flow. Most of the time, um, for vancomycin, we can give um, seven and a half to 10 milligrams per kilogram every 12 hours based on serum concentration monitoring. Um, and so you can actually just get um, a random concentration um, while they're on CRRT and you can adjust their dose uh, based on that level um, and trying to uh, aim for um, 15 to 20 for your um, concentration. If you get a concentration that's above that level, then obviously you can hold the dose um, and um, you can um, try to give it the next day, um, depending on when that um, random concentration is drawn on that patient. Um, next slide then. So when we have patients that are on dialysis, um, usually we start with um, 20 milligrams per kilogram as a loading dose. You want them to be therapeutic um, right away because these patients have um, a low threshold from um, getting complications from their MRSA infection. Um, and it's always important to allow the vancomycin to redistribute um, after the hemodialysis session. And so as the drug gets pulled out of the plasma from the hemodialyzer, then it has to re-equilibrate um, from your plasma back into your tissues. And so if you draw a concentration uh, with uh, before four hours after the end of the hemodialysis session, it might be falsely elevated. And so that's something that um, would cause you maybe to um, have um, spurious dosing recommendations. Um, and so that might cause um, a lot of questions about how to do that. And so it's best just to allow the drug to redistribute back into the tissues um, after the dialysis session um, and then get your um, random concentration after that dialysis session is, is completed. Um, next slide then. Okay, so to summarize everything we've discussed so far, um, patients with suspected MRSA infections, um, so serious MRSA infections, should have a target AUC to MIC ratio between 400 and 600. And this is to improve clinical safety, but also, um, or I'm sorry, to uh, improve clinical efficacy, but also to reduce um, any risk for toxicity. 
because vancomycin has a very narrow therapeutic window, um, AUC monitoring is preferred to trough monitoring. And again, this is for safety and also clinical efficacy. So um, as we discussed, there's two ways to calculate um, an AUC. The preferred method being Bayesian software. Um, this will use um, pharmacokinetic-based models to calculate it. Um, you can do this only with one level, and that level does not have to be a steady state. Um, if we do not have Bayesian software, then we can just use this um, use our levels, our peaks and our troughs, and do the first order pharmacokinetic equations to calculate the AUC. Um, given all the data that, that has been reviewed, trough-based monitoring is no longer recommended or preferred for serious MRSA infections. Um, and then MIC is really an important part of this AUC to MIC equation and recommendation. So we always want to make sure this MIC is about one for vancomycin. Um, if the MIC is greater than one, um, it's gonna be kind of difficult to get an AUC to MIC ratio of greater than 400. Um, also, if it's gonna be um, higher than one, we might be um, um, you know, not getting very susceptible organisms, so might need to switch to a different agent for MRSA altogether. And just some summary on dosing. Um, if we have an obese patient, their recommendation is to give a loading dose, so 20 to 25 per kilo using their actual body weight, um, but capping that at 3,000 milligrams. And then maintenance doses should not exceed more than 4,500 milligrams per day. Um, obviously, this has to take into account their renal function. Um, and if a patient is on such high dosing, um, making sure that we are getting continuous monitoring um, to ensure safety. For a non-obese patient with normal renal function, um, also giving a loading dose, um, max dose at 3,000 milligrams as well, and then a maintenance dose of 15 to 20 milligrams per kilo using actual body weight. Um, and then usually between um, every eight and 12 hours. Now this is just for normal renal function. Um, in this guideline, there are some limitations and basically there are really no randomized clinical trials to evaluate. Um, a lot of this data came from retrospective um, like monitor or clinical trials. And then um, the data for the AUC has been focused really on MRSA bacteremia. Um, there's a little bit for pneumonia, um, but none for osteo or meningitis. All right, so uh, we'll move on to some frequently asked questions um, with vancomycin dosing and then also um, some sample calculations for AUC monitoring. Um, so how do we empirically dose for a critically ill patient? Um, giving a loading dose is very important, um, and this is just to attain therapeutic levels right away. Um, so if a patient is coming in and, and it's a sepsis type situation, they have changes in their volume of distribution. So those higher doses become more important in attaining um, higher therapeutic levels right away. Um, and this is the same for dialysis patients. So just because their creatinine looks like it's off initially, um, that shouldn't scare us from just giving that one initial loading dose. Um, so what happens to trough monitoring? Um, these new guidelines are specific to serious MRSA infections, and that is where the AUC guidelines are being recommended. We can still monitor for troughs, um, and again, keeping the level between 15 and 20 for serious infections if we cannot get an AUC level. Um, still keeping the trough higher, like closer to 20 for CNS infections, um, lower for less serious infections, but also we do know that the higher the trough now, that the uh, more chance for toxicity. Um, and then collecting that trough level at steady state, which is usually before the fourth or fifth dose, depending on the regimen. Um, okay, so um, so the issue about vancomycin MIC is somewhat of a, um, can actually impact 
our dosing. So the susceptibility breakpoint, which is defined as the minimum inhibitory concentration that differentiates um, a sensitive staph aureus and a resistant staph aureus. So that's the breakpoint of two. So anybody that's um, close to two for their MIC is at increased risk of not clearing their bloodstream. So if you have an MIC of 1.5 or um, if you do it like for example if you do an e-test where you have the elliptical zone of inhibition and it comes out and it's um, 1.5 there are some differences in the MIC determination that can affect um, what the true MIC is based on broth micro dilution and so almost all of the MIC data for the vancomycin guidelines is based on broth micro dilution and if your hospital is using that as their MIC determination great you know you can have a lot of confidence in that MIC determination if you're using something other than <clears throat> broth micro dilution, then um, there will be some variability. Um, your MICs may be higher, um, which can affect whether or not it's comparable to the broth micro dilution. So um, there are a lot of automated um, susceptibility testing mechanisms out there. Um, these are basically based on um, some um, automated systems. And um, it's just important for you to know what system is being used at your hospital. Um, and so that's the first thing that I would do is call your micro lab and see how they're doing their susceptibility testing. Um, if they're sending them out for susceptibility testing, then you have to ask them where are they sending them to and then what are they using for their susceptibility testing at that particular laboratory center that they're sending it to. Um, so if you're um, MRSA MIC is close to two. It's difficult to achieve an AUC over MIC over 400, even if you have trough concentrations of 15 to 20. Um, and so those are the patients that um, maybe you need to switch to a different drug, um, maybe daptomycin or ceftaroline or something like that. Um, certainly those are uh, problematic organisms um, and um, you may not be able to clear their bloodstream um, quickly if you have an MIC that's close to two. Um, we have seen a, several MICs greater than two. They, those have been reported um, in uh, MMWR from the CDC. Um, but they're very infrequent, very infrequent. Um, so if you get an MIC greater than two, um, that might require you to send that isolate to the state public health lab so that they can retest it and make sure that it is truly greater than two. Um, you may get um, a call from the CDC then if that's the case, um, which um, you'd never want. So, um, okay, so here let's talk about some sample calculations. So, most of the time, the population volume of distribution for vancomycin using a one compartment model is between 0.7 and 0.85 liters per kilo. 
someplace in there. Um, it's very difficult and nobody can do it. Nobody can look at a patient and determine what their volume of distribution is. If I could do that, I would probably be on the lecture circuit. I wouldn't be in my current job, all right? Additionally, there is a, re a direct relationship between your elimination rate constant and your creatinine clearance. So this would be a, an equation that I would use, I would copy down and I would use all the time for all your patients that are receiving vancomycin. If you can calculate their creatinine clearance based on Cockroft-Galt equation using ideal body weight, then you can come up with a very appropriate um, KEL for that particular patient. Remember that 0.693 or the log of two divided by your KEL is equal to your half-life. So once you know your elimination rate constant, you can um, divide it, um, use it and, and have it div division, division by 0.693 um, uh, and then you've got your half-life for all patients. And so that's actually very useful for determining what the dosing interval should be for your patient. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so we have um, just some sample cal um, calculations to illustrate how we can apply this information um, for patients that are receiving vancomycin. So this is a 47-year-old female um, that's a, hemo, a, a chronic hemodialysis patient. And she's admitted to the hospital because she has some hyperkalemia and arrhythmias. Um, she normally receives her dialysis Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, um, but she hasn't gotten a ride for her dialysis appointments in three days. So she's missed um, two dialysis sessions, and that is the reason why she's hyperkalemic, because she isn't able to moderate her potassium um, because, of, because her um, ultrafiltrate will do that. So she's emergently dialyzed to um, normalize her potassium and her fluid overload. And then four days into her hospital stay, she spikes the temperature to 102.1. And the blood cultures are, are positive for staph aureus. And so the primary team um, is concerned she could have MRSA. Um, and so empirically, they're asking pharmacy to help them dose the vancomycin therapy. So, um, how would you do it? So you would probably give a loading dose. Remember that peak concentrations are dependent on dose. Trough concentrations are dependent on your clearance of the drug. So the loading dose will get you a therapeutic concentration. So 20 milligrams per kilogram multiplied by her body weight, her actual body weight, gives you 1300 milligrams. So you could round that to 1250 and you would give that um, as a loading dose. And then depending on when she gets her next dialysis session, you would want a draw level before her second dialysis session to um, basically see um, how much drug gets eliminated during her dialysis session. And so you can draw the serum concentration, the random serum concentration before her second dialysis session. And then you can give her 10 milligrams per kilogram after her second dialysis session is completed. And if you have a, um, a laboratory that um, the level is a send out, um, you would want that dose given um, before you get the result back. Um, so 
um, you would just give it to her as a, as a regular dose. All right, so that would be an appropriate regimen for her. She would get um, 10 milligrams per kilogram probably every second hemodialysis session. So you wouldn't give it to her um, every other day after her dialysis. You might give it to her every fourth day, and that might be something, but that would be dependent on what the um, concentration was after um, the dialysis session. Um, next slide then. Oh, um, okay, so the next calculation is a, is a little bit more involved. We have a 65-year-old a um, male who's obese. He's 121 kilograms. And he's been in the hospital for a CHF exacerbation for three days and he spikes the temperature to 101. Um, his white blood cells are a little elevated, but he has a normal um, SEGS and BAN um, percentages. His electrolytes are normal. Um, his BUN is 20 and his serum creatinine is 1.2. So blood cultures are drawn and reported back from the micro lab as gram-positive coccyon clusters. So gram-positive coccyon clusters could be staph aureus. Um, it might be something else, but um, the internal medicine physician is concerned about staph aureus and wants the patient to receive empiric vancomycin therapy uh, per pharmacy dosing. So we have to do some calculations based on um, the obesity factor. So um, the patient's ideal body weight is 68.4 kilos and the adjusted body weight is 89.4. So the adjusted body weight is the difference between ideal and actual multiplied by 40%, so 40% difference between those two, and then you add that to your ideal. And that would be the adjusted body weight. So again, we wanna give a loading dose for this patient, 20 milligrams per kilogram, multiplied by 121 kilos, because that's his actual weight, and it would be 24, 20 milligrams is the calculation. So you can round that to 2,000 milligrams or you can round that to 2,500 milligrams. And you're gonna infuse that over a couple of hours um, as the loading dose. Um, the next thing you wanna do is figure out the patient's creatinine clearance based on cockroft gault and you can use um, that and it's um, 77.6 is what I got for a, um, a calculation, a calculated creatinine clearance. So using the regression equation from before, um, you can figure out that the empiric half-life for this patient is about 10 hours. All right, so you can either give the dose every 12 hours or you could give the dose every 24 hours. And so, um, so how do we do some empiric calculations to determine what the concentrations should be given the loading dose and a maintenance dose? So remember that your peak concentration for vancomycin is um, dose divided by your volume distribution. So if you give 20 milligrams per kilogram as the dose and you divide it by 0.5 liters per kilo because that's what the normal, the population volume of distribution is for obese patients. Um, I don't know that's what his volume of distribution is, but he's part of the population um, of obese patients. And so I'm gonna assume that he has a lower than normal volume of distribution. So 20 divided by 0.5 gives me a peak of 40. All right, 
So then the minimum concentration after your first dose is equal to your maximum concentration that you just calculated times e to the negative kel um, and then tau minus ti so um, if you put in 24 hours and you infuse um, his loading dose over two hours then that would be um, 22 hours for so 22 times the kel which is 0.068 um, if you do the calculations, um, you get um, 0.224 for just e to the negative tau um, or KEL times tau minus TI. All right. If you give it every 12 hours, then basically your um, e to the negative KEL tau minus TI is 0.5. All right, um, and so um, so 40 is your peak times 0.5. That would be your trough concentration after your first dose if you give it 12 hours later. Otherwise, you could say um, 40 is your peak times 0.224, and your trough concentration is I think somewhere around eight or nine for your trough concentration. You guys can check me on that. And so you might wanna give a maintenance dose of seven and a half milligrams per kilogram times 21 kilos, and that you could round to a thousand milligrams every 12 hours. Um, and then uh, the ability to calculate your AUC is equal to your total daily dose divided by your creatinine clearance times 0.79 plus 15.4. Using this regression equation, we get an AUC of like 434. So it's, it's in the range where you want it to be. Um, and then you can um, optimize therapy based on um, whatever trough concentration comes back, um, and then you can uh, modify his dosing based on that. All right, so that would be um, an example of what you can do for an obese patient. All right, so if you wanted to give the obese patient um, a dose every 24 hours, um, then you might want to give, uh, basically just give the loading dose um, once a day. So instead of 7.5 milligrams per kilogram, you could give 15 milligrams per kilogram. So you'd give them 2,000 milligrams, but then you would give that um, uh, once a day, every 24 hours. And then that would basically give you the same AUC for the, depending on what you're giving for, um, for your calculations. Um, next slide then. All right, so do we have questions then, or does anybody need um, any, other, any other comments or anything? Hi, this is uh, Jim Allen, can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Great presentation from both of you. Thank you very, very much. Very comprehensive and up-to-date on the guidelines. Thank you. The question I have, on a practical basis is we talk about giving the Vanco at the end of dialysis, but all of the dialysis people I talk to and the renal physicians say that they usually start it, you know, they give it over one and a half to two hours, and they usually start it at some point prior to the ending of therapy, maybe at, you know, maybe right at two hours from the end of therapy or an hour, an hour and a half. And I understand that 25% under those circumstances, 25% of the bank was eliminated. Do you figure that into the calculations or how, how do you compensate for that? Sure. If, if, if that's what they automatically do, um, then there's certainly um, an increase in dose that you would 
you would want to supplement because some of the drug is being eliminated during the time that they're infusing. And so, um, you know, 25%, so you would probably increase your dose by 25%. So you would have to know that and then adjust to court. The pharmacists would have to know that, talk to the dialysis people, and then just to court, uh, adjust accordingly. Right. Okay. Right. Okay, great. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay. Great, great presentations, both of you. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Do you recommend using AUC dosing on MRSA bacteremia and trough monitoring for SSTIs or use AUC dosing as off-label for all non-serious infections? Um, so in, per the recommendations in the guideline um, that we don't have enough data to be able to say that we can do this for non-serious MRSA infections. Um, so that's just the recommendation based off of any studies we have. I guess it would be based on um, how severely ill the patient is. Um, if you have a patient with um, necrotizing fasciitis, um, then maybe you might want to do um, AUC dosing to optimize therapy for that patient because of the fluid shifts and things like that because of their um, septic shock type picture. Um, if they just have um, like a cellulitis, then um, maybe you, you don't have to be that aggressive. Chris and Samaya, this is uh, Jeff, Regional West Medical Center. Um, good presentation, thank you. Um, are you guys currently, do you have a calculator that you're using? Or I've heard a bunch of examples of people talking about clincalc.com. Um, I've also heard DoseMeRx, but I think that's a subscription, which uh, I think Jackie LaPlante's gonna talk about. Do you guys, do you guys using separate calculations or how are you guys doing it? Um, right now, currently, um, we are evaluating um, um, all of the non-Bayesian methods of dosing vancomycin for AUC. So I'm doing a little study on 50 patients that have um, two different doses and two different trough concentrations retrospectively. And then we're... Um, looking at five different methods um, that are either Excel-based or web-based programs like ClinCal um, and things like that. And so um, hopefully I'll have some more information um, after we um, do the evaluation on, on all those 50 patients to be able to say um, that this particular program works the best. And I'll be happy to send out a little email um, about our results once we get it done. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for the, thanks for the uh, update on this. All right, um, we can end here, but if anybody has any further questions, please feel free to reach out to me, um, to Dr. DeStash, to Jackie, to any of us, and uh, we'll share any information we might have. Thank you guys for joining us, and hopefully this was helpful for your practice.